everybody. My name is Spot, and uh, I was asked to uh, meet with this gentleman, Mark Cooley, here, and ask him a few questions about his life and uh, playing the viola. And I'm very happy that I was asked because I'm a former viola player myself, and um, this is a real viola player. So uh, anyway, Mark, it's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to, to be here and talking to you since we have a, a common interest. And uh, well, let's get started. Um, you've had a pretty interesting life. Uh, you've played with a number of people, both in the classical realm and in the popular music realm. You've done a lot of teaching, uh, instrument building and repair, and even photography, which is very impressive. It all had to have some place to start. And from looking over your, the notes on, on that I've, I, was got, I got, it looked like you started from a state of what I call emotional distress. Things were against you and uh, somehow you overcame that. What, um, what can you say about that? Well, um, I grew up in a small town, a uh, rural town, in uh, far uh, northwestern Illinois. And um, even for a small rural town, we were a very uh, poor family. And, um, and being a small town, it was, um, it was, it was rough for me. My, I came from a violent um, family um, upbringing, and that violence spilled over into uh, the way I was treated by the other um, my classmates because um, my father actually physically abused me in public, and that gave all the other kids the uh, kind of the license to do whatever they wanted. And um, so it was difficult for me, but there were, I was very lucky, there were several people that, um, adults that saw the situation that I was in and helped me out uh, uh, tremendously. Um, and there were several teachers, one um, that really encouraged, encouraged me um, to learn about my Irish heritage, um, and one that um, uh, my um, violin teacher who um, got me at a very early age um, into teaching. And um, there were several other people in, in the small town that got me um, into um, being socialized a little bit more. One was the, the postmaster of the small uh, post office in our town. Uh, she encouraged me to come to different um, uh, different things that she had organized, like uh, uh, t-shirt painting and things like that, that weren't, weren't really of an interest to me, but got me to mingle with other people and not be the loner um, that I was. Um, and it, it, it got me uh, into a, uh, an area where I wasn't, uh, didn't have to be afraid of people. And uh, another person in my, that early part of my life was uh, um, the minister of the church that I started going to. Um, he was uh, very impressed in, by the, the fact that I was so interested in, in learning um, that at one point he was training me, um, helping me to learn, um, to prepare to go into the ministry, to go to the um, the church-related college that uh, the church, the college that was related to the uh, denomination, the church that uh, I, I belong to, and so, and then there was also um, a, a local judge that had a large property across from where we lived, and um, he was a big influence because he. Um, taught me to uh, take care of the property that he had there. Part of the property was 
groomed and he had flowers and, and trees and he, he taught me a lot about landscaping. And then when it came, when I got into the music, he actually gave me um, money to go to music camps in the summer. And without that, um, I would have not, I think, made that step from just being a, a music student up to, to being a serious music student. Um, so all of those people, and there are others, but, but those are the, the main ones that really um, made a, a huge difference of me going from, uh, from what could have been a very violent and uh, uh, crimin, you know, uh, criminally based life mm. into, um, into a life where I, I sought out to be um, more educated um, and, and learn things and to want to learn things. And, and I directly um, attribute um, my desire to learn to those people. Mm -hmm. so. And um, it, what it, how old were you when, uh, let's say there was the first, might have been the first spark, some, some influence that made you think, hey, I can, I can take my own life in my hands here. Um, Approximately. Yeah, there, uh, it's, it's, that's not hard for me. Um, it was a, actually, a, 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 this is a story I, I tell a lot of people, especially my students. That, uh, um, I didn't get started playing until a very late age. Um, and um, one hot summer afternoon, I was, uh, we were outside, um, as we usually were, just um, playing. Or, um, at the age of 13, I was at uh, 12 at that time. And um, I came in um, to get a drink of water or something, and the television was on, as it usually was in our house. And it was back in the old days, on Sunday afternoons, before um, they had all the sports that they do, and they just put on whatever they could find to put on the small um, rural television stations. And there was a, a videotape of uh, a man playing the violin. And uh, it actually, at that time, it would have been a kinescope. But um, it was David Oistrakh, who was uh, one of the great Russian players, mm -hmm. studied with Leopold Auer, the same teacher that Heifetz and Milstein um, studied with. Actually, um, Milstein and, and Oistrakh didn't study directly with um, with um, hour they studied with um, his assistants. Um, but when I saw Oistrakh on television um, and saw that um, that he was making this beautiful, beautiful sound um, with this small wooden instrument, it just it made such an impression on me that I wanted to play the violin from that day on. And, mm -hmm. and I have always, even from a earlier age than that, I always was intrigued with wood and um, wooden objects and the, you know, the grains of wood and, and, and knowing, about, you know, it, it was just something that fascinated me. And to know that you could take different woods and, and, and make them into this basically small box and get this beautiful and, and large sound um, really intrigued me, but it took me um, quite a long time to uh, badger my parents into allowing me to, to take music lessons. It wasn't until I was 13 mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and in the middle of the, the school year, that I finally um, wore them down and was able to, to start um, taking uh, music lessons. Mm -hmm. That's so. a it's fascinating. <laughs> it's a pretty good, pretty good story. Do you remember uh, after you started taking music lessons and got your hands on a violin. Violin is your first instrument, correct? Violin is my, okay. was my first instrument. You yeah. picked the tough one. <laughs> Not like guitar yeah. or drums. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the first tune you learned? Yeah, it was, uh, I, as a matter of fact, yeah, it's another story that, um, as I said, I, I, I started in the uh, second semester um, and they were giving a winter concert 
and I had only played for a few weeks. And um, for some reason, the, the teacher decided that um, I had made enough progress that uh, he was going to stick me on this concert uh, playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. <laughs> um, and that was my first um, piece that I really learned because I, I was forced to learn it in a very short period of time and get it ready to play. Um, and that was my first solo also. Um, so not that long after I started playing, um, I was playing my first solo, which uh, frightened me to death. Mm -hmm. But it got me starting, started um, wanting to be a soloist. So, uh -huh. so that's, uh, that's the first piece that I played. So it, it, in your case, it wasn't ego deflating, it was more ego uh, supporting. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, it, it showed me that, um, that yes, I, you know, I can do this. Um, and it, uh, it didn't, you know, it, it, like all musicians, um, you know, it, it could have gone better, mm -hmm. but, but I, I, I felt that it went well. Um, at that age, and uh, it encouraged me. It certainly wasn't a discouraging um, uh, event in my life. It, uh, um, and um, I was the only person to play a solo on that concert, so Ooh. it was, to me, it was uh, an honor. And, and um, you know, it, it, again, it, it terrified me because it felt like a big burden before, but afterward, it was, uh, it's kind of like, Backpacking, another thing that I love to do. Um, you know, at the time when you're doing it, it seems like, why am I doing this? And then once it's, you're through it, you, you think about, wow, that was amazing. You know, I, I, I'm so glad I did that. And, and that is the, kind of the experience that I had in my first, my first uh, uh, experience with, with uh, performing in, uh, all by myself. Um, uh, in public. Great. Uh, and then from there, what, um, did you go into more, um, well, you've, you've worked with a number of uh, violin teachers, and apparently you even started teaching at a young age as well. Yeah. So at that point, you were developing a repertoire. Uh, what, um, uh, is there any way this, this question could be like, what kind of repertoire and with what teachers were you working and what kinds of things were you learning? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, it, people, when they know how old I am and I tell them how long I've been teaching, they, they usually sit down and try to figure out the math and, and they say, that doesn't, that really doesn't add up. That means you would have started teaching when you were 15 years old, uh, 14 or 15 years old. And I said, yeah. Um, and the reason for that is that um, the teacher that I was talking about um, earlier um, saw that um, I was serious about playing and learning and he had a, a very large, um, after school, he taught a very large um, uh, class, a Suzuki class, which is a, a, a method of teaching. And he had um, over 40 students in this class. So what he did was he, he would use me to uh, tune all these, these children. And as he would be on the podium teaching, he would have me go around and correct positions, hand positions, arm positions, bow, bowing, um, and and if I heard somebody playing, you know, uh, incorrectly, to try to get them, you know, uh, to describe to them what they needed to be uh, doing to be playing in tune, and that's how I basically learned how to teach was by being the teaching assistant, mm -hmm. and that's why. Um, at that you know, uh, early age, um, it wasn't long after um, being his teaching assistant that um, 
there were um, other students that um, needed uh, someone to help them, uh, and there was there was no there were no other private teachers in the area. So I started uh, giving private lessons uh, very soon after um, I was uh, an assistant teacher, mm -hmm. and that's how I got started so early, and I've um, taught for um, ever since. Um, and it's the numbers have gone up, but it's usually it had through all the years it had been pretty consistent. 20 to 40 students somewhere in there, mm -hmm. uh, private students. Yeah. So, and, and so when you started teaching at, at what age? About uh, 15? 15? 15, 15, yeah. 15. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, were you teaching mostly people your own age or children or mostly, did you ever have to teach adults? Uh, it, it varied. Um, early on it was um, students my own age. Um, then it, it got to be uh, younger and younger students until I was teaching beginners. And then um, once I graduated from high school and went on to college, then I had the whole range. I had all the way from very young students um, to, um, I think the, the oldest student that I started on violin was 84. Mm. And uh, she actually did a, a an excellent job um, for the two years that I had her. She, she made uh, very good progress. So I've had the whole range of, uh, of students and uh, students all, from all classes of, uh, of life um, with all kinds of, um, all the way from kids that could be categorized as geniuses to, um, to kids that were um, um, uh, had uh, learning challenges, and um, and I and that was a uh, one of the things that helped me to learn that I had to you have to adjust your teaching style to each student. You can't mm -hmm. just have one cut cut and dried way of teaching. Uh, it, it varies from student to student. Yeah, there's no one size fits all. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 you know, I was going to ask you something, but from what you've said, uh, you pro there's probably no particular age that you found that makes a better student. Um, no, not really. It's a matter um, of interest and desire. Yes, definitely. Right. That's that's the big thing, um, interest, and it helps a lot. The only thing that really is a big advantage is if it is a student, a younger student that has had siblings. Um, I've had more um, more times than you might think. I've had uh, students where I've had uh, three students from the same family, and um, the first um, you can always tell that there's, there's a big difference between how difficult it is for the first student, the first member of the family, to get started. And by the time you get to the third member of the family, it's so much easier because they've been exposed and, and some of them actually ha had um, um, attended uh, the other um, family members' lessons but just because they were dropped off at the same time and they would have their lessons um, sequentially, and so you'd just go from one and the other one would study while the other was having their lesson. And just being there, they would absorb a lot, um, and then hearing their other siblings practice. Um, that, that, I think, is probably the biggest advantage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of the other things that are uh, uh, passed off as, as quick starts and ways to help students get going fast I found are, are, are dubious at best. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, the only one that I've really found that is, is almost always useful is, is, is having a, a sibling that, um, that plays. Mm -hmm. Was there any uh, particular 
technique or approach you would you found yourself relying on with most students? Um, I used basically what would be called the traditional way of teaching, which is um, um, uh, is different than, say, the Suzuki system, which was uh, uh, teaching by rote and having the, the, the students um, uh, play back what they hear the teacher play. That tends, in my opinion, that tends to be a, uh, too rigid and um, the students tend to miss a lot of things about theory and, and a lot, a lot of, um, of the finer points. Um, and with, with the way that I teach, you, you just basically sit down with the student, um, you give them music to play, and um, you play along with them, and then you have them play it back, and then you analyze uh, what they do, and you point out to them what needs to be corrected, and you have them correct that. And one of the things that I always tell my students is that, um, especially in a, in a market like Sheboygan, where a lot of the students are, are not going to go on to be soloists uh, or even uh, play in major symphonies, um, I've always told my students that if I don't teach you anything else, I want to teach you analytical skills, how to analyze, because that's really what um, practicing is about. And if you can analyze and um, in your practicing, you can utilize that in whatever uh, you go into. And you, you can use it in, in math, you can use it in theater, you can use it so it, you can use those analytical skills in every other field that you're going to go into. And that is, I think, one of the, the most overlooked um, advantage of giving your child uh, music lessons is that's one of the things that they learn is, is how to analyze. Teach them to think around the notes and through the notes. Right. Okay. When did the viola come in? Uh, the viola actually came in very quickly after um, the violin. Um, it, uh, I loved the, the lower sound and the, the, the deeper, more soulful sound that a viola gets. And so uh, I, I will be playing a recital um, uh, soon. And um, the, I'm playing a viola piece, a viola concerto, uh, and there the Telemann, a G major viola concerto. And I actually learned to play viola with that piece. I, I took that piece and I taught myself how to learn. Um, um, because the viola, most people don't realize this, is actually in a, a different clef. Um, it's written in the alto clef, and not very many instruments use that clef. So you have to learn how to read um, a different clef to play, um, al uh, play the viola. Um, and as a matter of fact, in, um, the viola is referred to in, in some languages as alto in, in a lot of um, parts. Um, you will, when they hand out the parts on the top, uh, the viola will it'll be written alto. Um, so um, it is considered an alto instrument, the alto instrument of the string section. Um, and um, so I took this Telemann concerto and I taught myself how to read the clef and then um, I played both instruments. As a matter of fact, I think my first paid gigs um, were on viola rather than yeah. violin. And when I got into college, um, I played um, kind of on the side and um, my teachers said, you know, as long as you're, you, you know, you play that well, you might as well take a double major. And so I had a, a double major in both violin and viola, which adds a lot of, um, a lot of practice time and a lot of performing time, because I would have to split the time that I, um, uh, you'd have to give double the number of recitals, double, you know, and, um, and because I, um, I would usually be the concert master of the, the, the orchestra. I would spend a semester being concert master 
and then I would spend a semester being principal viola, mm -hmm. and it would go back and forth. And, um, which, and it also means when you're doing your chamber music, in the string quartet, I would play violin. Uh, one semester, um, um, I would be playing violin, or in some semester, I, I would be in two ensembles. I would be playing violin in one and viola in another. Mm -hmm. So it means uh, a lot more playing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's not something that's done a lot. A lot of people will play both instruments, but not very many people get a major on, on, on both instruments in performance. Okay, so you, okay, you went from, you did classical work and then you also did work in the pop field. And this is, this is a question I wanted to ask you. One of the people you worked with uh, was Burt Bacharach. Yeah. yeah. And his first big break was composing the theme music to the movie The Blob, mm -hmm. which most people don't know, and it's just a crazy piece of music. Mm -hmm. um, what was, since we're at the point where you started making money, what was your first break in making money or being in, you know, be, being able to support yourself from playing? Um, well, it, uh, that's hard to say because I was already making, making money playing in high school, um, playing for, um, when you're a freelance player and you make your living as a freelance player, you have to do a lot of um, weddings and funerals mm -hmm. and bar mitzvahs and you name it. And so um, I got, I was already doing a lot of that type of work. Um, I think when I joined the, the Musicians Union is really the big leap uh, because that's when, because um, major symphony players are tied up with symphony jobs, so the um, freelancers um, in the union get to do the, uh, the tours or the, the shows with the pop players more frequently than, than the, uh, the full-time symphony players. And that's really what got me into you know, uh, making, the, where you could make, make a living, mm -hmm. is uh, that and when I started to get um, principal uh, uh, concertmaster positions mm -hmm. with, uh, with community orchestras. Right. Did you prefer one world over the other or did it matter? No, it didn't really matter. Um, the pop music was fun because it usually wasn't difficult and, um, and the audiences were enthusiastic. It, it was fun to do, um, but, um, but your first love, of course, is always, you know, the, the classical. Um, I always loved, uh, you know, um, and being, you know, playing concertmaster um, or doing, one of the things that I love, I suppose if, if I had to pick one of the things that I really love to do the most is play concertmaster for musicals. Ah. Um, because you get these solos all the time mm -hmm. that are kind of built for me. Um, the kind of playing that I do is um, as, a, as a ringer, which is someone that comes into a community orchestra uh, for the last rehearsal and the concert, um, doesn't go for all six or eight uh, rehearsals you come in and they expect you to know your part and they expect you to help drag the weaker players mm -hmm. um, through. And, um, and as a ringer, you learn to, to be very, um, they have a big sound and be, uh, be able to, um, to back off when you need to or bring a play out when you need to. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need to do to, when you're the concert master in a, in a pit orchestra or doing musicals would be a pit orchestra. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, when you, you get some incredibly beautiful solos in, uh, in, um, in musicals, um, a, a, a very little known um, uh, musical, um, um, I always get it confused with Carousel. Um, it's not Carousel, it's um, uh, the other one. Um, 
where love makes the world go round. Anyhow, it has a beautiful, um, uh, a beautiful duet between the the lead male and female with a with the violin solo mm -hmm. tied in, and it's one of the most. Uh, it's right in there with with any of the beautiful um, operatic mm -hmm. um, uh, solos that there are like that. Um, so there there are a lot of rewarding. Um, very rewarding things in doing musicals for, for violinists. Yeah, definitely are. Now, so, uh, I was noticing that a couple of the um, more pop artists you played with, uh, there was Barry White and Tom Jones, which are two of my favorite over-the-top dramatic yes, performers. Very, yeah. And, uh, you know, that that's, uh, you know, I just, I just love that. And, but also with the, uh, you know, Milwaukee Ballet, the, the Joff? The Joffrey Ballet, Joffrey which ballet. is based in New York. Fireside Theater, you know, concert master for the Manitowoc Symphony Orchestra, locally. That's a, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of work you've done. But I want to talk about your instrument here. Yeah. Um, this instrument apparently was uh, built roughly around the 1820s. Yes. You say. And... Uh, one of it's it's a, it's a very rare instrument, and uh, tell me about that. Well, this instrument was built by um, uh, a man who was considered the second best French violin maker of all times. Um, his name was Charles Gan, and uh, spelled G A N D, and uh, he was the instrument maker for Napoleon. And um, after Napoleon was deposed, and af even after Napoleon died, he was still kept on as the official court instrument maker. So he never really made instruments that were for sale. He made instruments strictly, or almost strictly, there may have been a few instruments that were made for individuals, but um, he was strictly there to make new instruments, to replace the old instruments, in the French Royal Orchestra. And the only other duty he had was to make a violin every year for the, um, the um, competition for the Royal Conservatory. Um, and then they would, the first prize was a violin made by Charles Gann. And um, this is the only viola known to exist um, that was made by Charles Gann. The rest have been um, uh, lost throughout mm -hmm. history. So. Um, and it has, has a lot of distinguishing characteristics that um, anyone that's familiar with his work would, would recognize right away. So, mm -hmm. um, so it does, the way you distinguish it from um, whether it was made before or after Napoleon died is that this has a label that says um, made for the, um, the orchestra of the, of the king which would have been Louis the 17th, who was a figurehead. Um, and the ones before that were, um, had a label that said, made for the, um, the orchestra of the, king, of the emperor, mm -hmm. um, which of course would have been Emperor Napoleon. Mm -hmm. So, so e eBayers need to know that. <laughs> eBayers, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. If they find yeah, one. Yeah. Okay, so um, it seems that you're going to be parting with the instrument? Yes, uh, because of my health, um, uh, I'm no longer able to play viola. Um, I was supposed to give up playing viola 10 years ago, but uh, I, uh, I, um, let's say I um, went against, against medical advice and uh, have continued to play, but now it is to the point where I, um, it is, it, it's, because it is the physically most demanding instrument in, in the orchestra to play, um, it is getting to be too difficult for me to play. Um, so this concert that I'm giving will be the last time that I play it, and it will be going um, to be appraised, and then it will be going um, eventually to New York to go um, on uh, mm -hmm. auction. That's, uh, it's, it's sad to see the instrument go. Yes, that's very sad. For especially me, you know an instrument that uh, you know was in the hands of someone who really, uh, really knew how to play it. 
<laughs> as, I, as, I, as I heard you play. And as a matter of fact, um, I think maybe, maybe we should, I, I'd like to hear, I'd mm. like to hear, uh, okay. hear you play a little bit. All right. I think that'd be wonderful. Okay. Uh, pleased to do that. And this um, piece that I'm going to be playing is uh, part of a, a cello suite um, that Bach wrote. Uh, yep. And uh, people don't realize this, but Bach was a, an avid violist. And uh, one of the manuscripts for these, even though they were written for, for cello, um, actually says, um, written for alto uh, violin cello which uh, is kind of suspicious because it leads me to believe that he uh, actually wrote them on the viola and knowing cello, um, uh -huh. he, he then um, wrote them out for cello. Um, but I, I suspect that he had quite uh, um, a good time playing these um, since they're very well suited for the viola. So mm -hmm. this is the um, prelude to the first um, Bach suite for cello. That's a fine instrument in the hands of a fine player. Thank you. And uh, now, will that be one of the pieces you'll be playing uh, Sunday? No, that will not. It, oh. um, uh, it may be an encore, but it might. It's <laughs> not one that's that's scheduled to, to be playing. Um, oh. I, I'm very I'm lucky enough to have a, a chamber orchestra um, to a, accompany me this, uh, which is uh, very very um, humbling that. Um, uh, my friends were um, willing to get together, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and some of these people are professionals, and 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 willing to get together and, and put on a a, a concert, uh, back you know play 
accompaniment for me. And, and it'll, be, it'll be your last performance. Yes, it will be this, my last performance. And probably my last performance. Uh, wow. um, uh, probably my last uh, playing mm -hmm. uh, performance. So uh, I'm very honored that they're willing to do it for me. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, most of my um, most of my music was done in the more like the rock and jazz field, and uh, but I've always loved classical and knew quite a few classical players when I was uh, learning and being in bands and and et cetera. I came to the decision one day that um, the difference between rock and classical players is that classical players are paid, when they get paid, to play music. And rock musicians, when they're, when they're paid, are paid to load and unload their equipment, basically. And uh, now I know that you had um, a lot of uh, experience in the in the pop field and mm -hmm. in the classical field, and and you just maybe you know as we're wrapping this up, are there any really amazing, funny, poignant, or noteworthy stories you have about some experience performing in either of those either of those realms? Oh yeah, there there are there are many. Uh, I do have if I got time there are there are two um, in the pop field that are that are um, the ones that stand out the most for me um, one uh, has to do with Packers um, and um, it was uh, the year after they won the Super Bowl and um, we were working with uh, we were doing the Burt back rack mm -hmm. um, and I was sitting actually closer to him than I am to you when he was playing the electric piano. You were sitting close to Bacharach himself. Yeah, he uh, actually... When was this? Oh, uh, what they, when did they win? The 97, so it would have been 98. Okay. Um, and um, during the break um, of the rehearsal, um, his assistant came onto the stage with a shopping bag and um, and, and Mr. Backrack got all excited and, and looked like a, a child in a candy store. And he's looking at all these things in, the, in, the, in, this, in this bag. And it turns out that this, this concert was um, sponsored by, um, partially sponsored by the Packers. And, um, and, and, um, and the coach, um, uh, I forget his first name now, Mr. Holmgren, was in the, gonna be in the audience, and he brought a whole bag of autographed, Brett Favre autographed items to give oh, to Burt Backrack. So, Bert, so it was interesting to see uh, this famous man, Burt Backrack, one of the most famous you know, pop writers of all time, so excited about getting this, this bag of, of autographed um, um, Brett Favre materials. And, <laughs> Who uh, wouldn't be? And it was, you know, <laughs> And, it, and yeah, well, he's from California, though. You know, it's like <laughs> so. Um, so that was one of them. Uh, as far as 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 really in the pop field, um, the performers that stood out the most to me was Smokey Robinson. Oh. Working with Smokey Robinson was was a, a real honor. Talk about he is one of the most professional, mm. one of the most incredibly. Um, uh, generous uh, men that I have ever worked with and is just an expert at working the crowd, getting the crowd to, to get into the music and, uh, and, and once he gets warmed up, he, just, he still sounds like mm -hmm. the Smokey Robinson that you hear on the recordings. Uh -huh. He just absolutely, it was, a, it was so fun. To, to be able to look up from the music and see Smokey Robinson standing, you know, 10 feet away, you know. Um, yeah. And he took the time after the performance to stop and say thank you to every orchestra member, which is very rare. 
What a guy. Um, yeah, he's just an absolutely yeah. wonderful man. Yeah. I've always felt that his songwriting abilities were rather underrated. Very. And yeah. um, I think that if you listen, if you really listen to his work, I think that uh, his work has a lot in common with Hank Williams. Yeah. It seems that, that they're writing from a lot of the same feelings yeah. in that. Yeah. Anyway, you said that you might have had some, uh, another story? Um, well, there, there are all kinds of odd things that happened during, uh, going back into the classical field. Um, we used to do, I used to play um, in uh, an orchestra that used to be the um, Music Under the Stars um, mm -hmm. orchestra in Milwaukee, and it, it, had been, it was a tradition uh, for this orchestra to play in Washington Park um, uh, every summer and they had huge crowds. And um, one summer we did a, uh, a show with a woman that was doing a, uh, a Edith Piaf um, tribute. And um, the ambassador from France was, was there. And um, we were uh, getting ready to play. And in his honor, we, we not only played the national anthem as we always did before each concert, but we also played the French national anthem. And just as we started to play, this big gust of wind came up and blew my music off of the, the stand. And this was a good 20 yards away. The music blew directly into the lap of the ambassador of France. And the odds of that happening are, are what, you know, how, what are the odds of that happening? And, and so after the concert, he, he, you know, during the intermission, he brought this music back and gave it to the, the stage manager, and uh, I got the music back. So it was uh, that that you know things like that you know that that you remember things like that that stick with you. But so. you, okay, your music blew away. But so what did you do? That's I looked over the shoulder of ah, the person in front of me. Faked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically yes. And one of the and, and it surprises people that um, when when I uh, talk about what are the first things you teach your students. One of the first things when, they, when I know that they're going into an orchestra is how to fake. Because you're not going to be able to play every note. You can't. It's physically impossible. So you have to know that when you get off, if you get off, how to look like you're with everybody else and how to get back in with everybody else is one of the, the major skills you have to know as a, as a violinist or a violist or a cellist um, is how to fake. Uh, it's, it's a very important skill. So it's uh, it's one of the purposes of an orchestra. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So okay, well this has been uh, this has been great talking to you, and uh, I'm just going to conclude by saying that it's um, uh, it's it's really it's really a thrill to see this instrument, hear this instrument, to meet you, to hear you playing it, to watch you play it. Um, it's making me want to go back home and get mine out of the case, even though it's broken now, and uh, do something with it. You know, yeah. it, it's, uh, you know. You should. You're right, I should. <laughs> and um, I've always felt that it was a little, it was kind of a shame how most people really don't understand the viola. There's a lot of people who think that, oh, the violin, the violin. They look at you and they say, oh, he's playing a violin. Um, but there, there's not, unfortunately, there's not a big vocabulary for it no. or yeah. repertoire for it, which is fortunately changing. You and I both know that. And uh, I just hope that if nothing else, um, there might be a musician, a budding musician, uh, out there watching this thinking, hey, that might be the instrument for me. Yes. And uh, I think that would be the yes, that best and, outcome and of this. That and, and if there are any budding composers that would like to, to write some, some music for, you know, more music for the viola solo, uh, that would be also something that I would hope. Um, because... Uh, there definitely needs to be even more music written for the. It's such a beautiful sounding instrument. Um, mm -hmm. It uh, it really does need the repertoire. So. Mm -hmm. it does so. Okay. 
Well, Mark, this has been a pleasure. I no. thank you. I thank from you. From the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I'll just leave you with three words. Practice, practice, practice.